Hey everyone, in today's episode, I want to talk about a movement in the Catholic Church called liberation theology and help you understand what's wrong with some aspects of it. But before I do that, though, I want to thank everyone who's been supporting our channel. And if you want to help us to reach more people, please like this video, subscribe to the channel, and consider supporting us at TrentHornPodcast.com. All right, so what motivated me to talk about today's topic was an article in the Wall Street Journal called Why the Catholic Church is Losing Latin America. It was published back in January, so I'm just getting to it now. Apologies for that. Anyway, I want to share with you a, a few excerpts from it all put together. Uh, it's a little lengthy, but it's, it's really good. I want to read these excerpts, and I'll tell you how it relates to liberation theology. So the article says, For centuries, to be Latin American was to be Catholic. The religion faced virtually no competition. Today, Catholicism has lost adherence to other faiths in the region, especially Pentecostalism, and more recently to the ranks of the unchurched. The shift has continued under the first Latin American pope. In a symbolic milestone, Brazil, which has the most Catholics of any country in the world, is expected to become minority Catholic as soon as this year, according to estimates by academics that track religious affiliation. In Rio State, it has already happened. Catholics make up 46% of the population, according to the latest national census in 2010, and a little more than a third of some poverty-stricken favelas or slums. The Vatican is losing the biggest Catholic country in the world. That's a huge loss, an irreversible one, said Jose Estigao Diniz Alves, a leading Brazilian demographer and former professor at the National Statistics Agency. At the current rate, he estimates Catholics will account for fewer than 50% of all Brazilians by early July. The reasons for this shift are complex, including political changes that reduce the Catholic Church's advantages over other religions, as well as growing secularization in much of the world. During the pandemic, evangelical churches have been especially effective at using social media to keep people engaged, said Mr. Diniz Alves. Critics inside and outside the Catholic Church also point to its failures to satisfy the religious and social demands of many people, especially among the poor. Latin Americans often describe the Catholic Church as out of touch with everyday struggles of its congregation. According to the 2014 Pew survey, the most popular reason given by former Catholics in Latin America for embracing some form of Protestantism was to have a more personal connection with God, cited by 81% of respondents. Nearly 6 in 10 said they left Catholicism because they found a church that helps members more. The rise of liberation theology in the 1960s and 70s, a time when the Catholic Church in Latin America increasingly stressed its mission as one of social justice, in some cases drawing on Marxist ideas, failed to counter the appeal of Protestant faiths. Or in the words of a now legendary quip variously attributed to Catholic and Protestant sources, the Catholic Church opted for the poor, and the poor opted for the Pentecostals. All right, so I'll link to the article below, and I definitely recommend that you check out the whole thing. But what really struck out to me was the idea that the Church tried to advocate for the poor through liberation theology, but that system is not what the poor needed or wanted. And so the poor went to other churches that focused on the person of Jesus Christ. Now, this isn't the whole picture. And as the article notes, some people are attracted to Protestant churches in Latin America because they preach the prosperity gospel. It's the idea that if you're holy, God won't let you stay poor. I have a video on that subject on my channel if you want to see what's wrong with prosperity theology as well. But this does seem to be the natural consequence of the Church trying to merge Christianity's concern for the poor with secular, materialist roots of Marxism that's found in a lot of liberation theology. You not only fail to help the poor in a material way, you also fail to help them in a spiritual way to find the true riches that are in the kingdom of God. Because your theology has basically turned into a Marxist political program. All right, so what is liberation theology and what's wrong with it? The term was coined by Father Gustavo Gutierrez in 1971 and later expanded upon in his book, A Theology of Liberation. Liberation theology is a pretty wide field and includes a lot of different areas. 
But for the sake of brevity and clarity, I'm just going to focus on Latin American liberation theology. So this liberation theology says that Christ came to liberate us not just from the spiritual effects of sin, but its temporal effects, like poverty. In particular, Christians are called to side with the poor in their struggle to be liberated, and that involves more than charity. It involves equipping the poor to change their social structures so they can be liberated from the bondage that poverty causes. Finally, liberation theology says it's a reflection on praxis. It learns from the practice of the faith more than the practice of the faith learning from abstract theological principles. Now, on the surface, some of that sounds just fine. Matthew 25 makes it clear we have an obligation to care for the poor. And the Bible repeatedly condemns rich people who exploit the poor. James chapter 5 says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud. Cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. James chapter 2 also condemns showing favoritism to rich people. It says, For if a man with gold rings and in fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and say, Have a seat here, please, while you say to the poor man, Stand there or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Finally, the Catechism says, Sin makes men accomplices of one another, and causes concupiscence, violence, and injustice to reign among them. Sins give rise to social situations and institutions that are contrary to the divine goodness. Structures of sin are the expression and effect of personal sins. They lead their victims to do evil in their turn. In an analogous sense, they constitute a social sin. So, there's a lot of things in liberation theology that are true. But you can find true things in lots of problematic theology. That's why the CDF called its 1984 criticism instruction on certain aspects of theology of liberation. When you read big-name liberation theologians, you'll see they go way beyond the charity Christ calls us to in the Gospels. Here's some of the biggest problems. First, liberation theology joins Christian theology to the errors of Marxism. As I show in my book, Can a Catholic Be a Socialist?, the Church has repeatedly condemned communism, socialism, and the other natural results of Marxist uh, ideology. Now, some liberation theologians say, well, you don't have to be a Marxist. One Jesuit author at America Magazine writes, Accusations of Marxism have been at the center of magisterial critique, but most liberation theologians assert that they are not Marxists, but that they make use of Marxism as a social science, just as other theologians make use of non-Catholic philosophers, like Aristotle in the case of St. Thomas Aquinas, and Martin Heidegger in the case of Karl Rahner. But Aquinas's use of the true things found in Aristotle is not the same as the errors of Marxism that are at the forefront of liberation theology. For example, liberation theologian Leonardo Boff says, Liberation theology feels no obligation to account to social scientists for any use it makes, correct or otherwise, of Marxist terminology and ideas. Liberation theology freely borrows from Marxism. Gutierrez condemns systems that allow for the accumulation of capital or money to be invested into companies. He says our goal should be to transform this society, which has been built on private property over the means of production. But in the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx says something similar. The theory of the communists may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. That's why Pope Leo XIII said socialism is contrary to the natural right to own private property, and that the main tenet of socialism, the community of goods, must be utterly rejected. But in Quadragesimo Anno and Rerum Novarum, the popes taught there is a natural right to private property, not unlimited, but a natural right. And they taught that capitalism is not intrinsically evil. In liberation theologian Jose Miranda, he says, well, Marxism's errors are its atheism and materialism. He says, not only is communism not an error, he says, for a Christian to be anti-communist is, it constitutes 
the greatest scandal of our century. Now compare that to Pope Pius XI, who said, communism is intrinsically wrong, and no one who would save Christian civilization may collaborate with it in any undertaking whatsoever. All right, so point number two. Liberation theology reduces salvation to escaping from suffering in this life. One way we can see how eternal life is squeezed out of the faith in liberation theology, you can see it in liberation theologian John Sabrino's work on martyrdom. Traditionally, a martyr is someone who voluntarily chose death instead of renouncing the Christian faith. Now, the Magisterium has seen slight developments in this definition, like when it called Father Maximilian Kolbe a martyr of charity because he died in the place of another man in a concentration camp. But Sabrino goes way beyond that in saying that martyrdom can be applied to anyone who dies because they were trying to enact structural change on behalf of the poor. Sabrino even says martyrdom can be applied to non-Christians who die because they fought on behalf of the poor. Sabrino calls these people Jesus martyrs, He says, Jesus martyrs are not, strictly speaking, those who die for Christ, but those who die like Jesus and for the cause of Jesus. Their martyrdom does not result from fidelity to some mandate of Jesus's, or even from a desire for mystical identification with the crucified Jesus, but arises out of their effective following of Jesus. So martyrdom isn't about dying for your belief in the God-man Jesus Christ, but dying for a social justice system that seems to cohere with Jesus. Probably the biggest criticism of liberation theology is that in trying to advocate for liberating the poor from material poverty, the focus moves away, sometimes almost entirely, from liberating people from spiritual poverty. Salvation is focused on just eradicating material poverty, which for these theologians means eradicating unjust systems they think are at the root of poverty. The CDF report on liberation theology, however, rebuked the idea that evil can be localized principally or uniquely in bad social, political, or economic structures, as though all other evils came from them, so that the creation of the new man would depend on the establishment of different economic and socio-political structures. Now, liberation theologians like Juan Segundo, they blasted the 84 CDF instruction. Segundo wrote a response to it called Theology and the Church, a response to Cardinal Ratzinger and a warning to the whole church. Segundo and others claimed the church's response was, in the words of political scholar Paul Sigmund, a general attack on Enlightenment humanism and modern thought aimed at reestablishing an otherworldly and transcendentalist religion. And there's the problem. A lot of liberation theologians, for them, the faith is just a political struggle to get earthly outcomes. It's not about an otherworldly sense, our beatific hope. And that's ridiculous, because in John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Luke 6, 20, Jesus says the poor will be blessed because of their inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. In a 2014 press conference, Cardinal Gerhard Moeller told an audience which included Juan Segundo in the audience, by the way. The church speaks about poor in a very different way than the communists do. Christians do not dream of an earthly paradise, and the communists always blamed us that the church only deals with heaven. Now, we should work for justice, but we can't think that our faith is only about creating heaven on earth. We see this in priests like Father Ernesto Cardinal, uh, who was disciplined by Pope St. John Paul II because he refused to follow canon law and resign from his position in the Nicaraguan government after the 1979 revolution. When he knelt before the Pope in 1983, John Paul II wagged his finger at him and said, you must fix your affairs with the church. He didn't, so he was suspended from ministry a year later. He wasn't reinstated until 2019 by Pope Francis. And something similar happened to Bishop Lugo, who was dismissed from the clerical state to become president of Paraguay in 2008. So we just see so often in liberation theology this myopic focus on reducing material poverty, which in itself is a good thing. Now remember, it's bad if you only focus on spiritual poverty and you don't care about material poverty. That's bad. But you can go in the opposite direction as well 
and focus solely on trying to eradicate material poverty that you forget about the most important thing. I mean, think about what Jesus said. Should we fear more the man who can destroy the body or he who can destroy the soul in hell? All right, number three, liberation theology makes an idol out of the poor. The Catechism says, in its various forms, material deprivation, unjust oppression, physical and psychological illness and death, human misery is the obvious sign of the inherited condition of frailty and need for salvation in which man finds himself as a consequence of original sin. This misery elicited the compassion of Christ the Savior, who willingly took it upon himself and identified himself with the least of his brethren. Hence, those who are oppressed by poverty are the object of a preferential love on the part of the Church, which since her origin and in spite of the failings of many of her members, has not ceased to work for their relief, defense, and liberation through numerous works of charity, which remain indispensable always and everywhere. But liberation theologians go way beyond the preferential option for the poor that's described in the Catechism. They treat the poor almost as if they have a special salvific status in virtue of their poverty. According to Leonardo Boff, from the moment when God became man-poor, man-poor became the measure of all things. As a result, the poor don't have a need for conversion. Their salvation is primarily about their condition in this life. Gutierrez even said, ever since God became man, the entire humanity has become the living temple of God. Every person, the profane, which is outside the temple, now no longer exists. So you probably won't be surprised to hear that Leonardo Boff left the priesthood, and now he calls himself theologically homeless. Now you may be surprised to learn that Boff has a brother, Clodophus Boff, and he didn't go down the same path. He critiques newer forms of liberation theology that deviated from what the Latin American bishops originally proposed. He says things like his brother's works, they commit fatal error, the fatal error of setting up the poor as the first operative principle of theology, substituting them for God and Jesus Christ. In 1985, Leonardo Boff was prohibited from teaching theology because of his book, Church, Charism, and Power. What ends up happening in liberation theology and feminist theology, too, is that if God is most present in a minority community, let's say the poor or women, then you need to tear down any authority that stands in place of God, including the church. The CDF said the following of Leonardo Boff's book. In his own words, Boff claims, Jesus did not have in mind the church as institution, but rather that it evolved after the resurrection particularly as part of the process of de-eschatologization. Consequently for him, the hierarchy is a result of the powerful need to organize and an assuming of societal characteristics in the Roman and feudal style. Hence, the necessity arises for permanent change in the church. Today, a new church must arise, which will be an alternative for the incarnation of new ecclesial institutions whose power will be pure service. In other words, we don't need a church because the people, especially the poor, they are the church. But the poor aren't our saviors. They are the ones who need to be saved because every single human being needs to be saved from sin. There are virtuous rich people and virtuous poor people. There are wicked rich people and wicked poor people. But none of us achieve salvation because of our social status in life. Only Christ saves us from sins. But among liberation theologians, salvation isn't about Christ saving humanity. It's about Christ siding with the oppressed against an oppressor class in Marxist terms. Gutierrez says, The class struggle is a fact that Christians cannot dodge, and in the face of which the demands of the gospel must be clearly stated. But in his critique of liberation theology, the theologian Jean Gallat says, a program for a class struggle is completely foreign to Jesus' intentions and mentality. The class struggle implies a clear-cut exclusion directed against a certain class. It assumes that the social sin of exploitation and injustice is concentrated in this class, and hence this social class must be eliminated. In light of the gospel, we cannot accept such a struggle. Number four. Liberation theology encourages unjustifiable violence. 
Let's go back to the 1984 CDF instruction on some aspects of liberation theology. The CDF agreed Christians have a special obligation to help the poor. So we talked about this earlier. That's the preferential option for the poor. It also says that we should not tolerate unjust conditions that create widespread poverty. But the document goes on to quote Pope Paul VI, who said it was dangerous to enter into the practice of class struggle and of its Marxist interpretation, while failing to see the kind of totalitarian society to which the process slowly leads. You see the sympathy for violent revolution in works like A Theology of Liberation by Father Gutierrez. He writes the following, The liberation of our continent means more than overcoming economic, social, and political dependence. It is to see man in search of a qualitatively different society, in which he will be free from all servitude, in which he will be the artisan of his own destiny. It is to seek the building of a new humanity. Ernesto Guevara wrote, We revolutionaries often lack the knowledge and the intellectual audacity to face the task of the development of a new human being by methods different from the conventional ones. Gutierrez also said there's, quote, more zealousness for the Lord in the Christians who participate in the revolutionary processes in Latin America than in the egotistical Christian circles which consider such involvement to be disturbing. Notice he quotes Ernesto Guevara, Che Guevara, a.k.a. Che. He's, the name's probably familiar to you. He's the guy who's hung up in every college socialist dorm room looking really cool in his beret. Uh, what most people don't know, especially college socialists, is that Che Guevara, during the Cuban Revolution, he banned newspapers and freedom of speech. He forced people into labor camps. They were called military units to aid production. He even executed people if he wasn't sure that they had committed a crime. So when you hear talk about his methods, that should ring back to your ears Pope Paul VI's warning that Marxist thought inevitably leads to totalitarianism. It has to, because if liberation theologians believe capitalism needs to be abolished. It follows that the state is going to have to exercise total control over the economy. Total, totalitarian. I talked about this in my video on the protests in Cuba last year, which show that socialism, it just doesn't work. It creates what Pope Leo XIII called a harvest of misery. In Cuba, people are given ration stamps to control how much food they're allowed to have. But it's never enough, so people end up going to the black market to get what they need. But if you're caught selling things like chicken or eggs on the black market, you can end up in a Cuban prison for 20 years. But throughout history, communist governments controlled people not just economically. They used violence in order to preserve what they considered to be the greater good. The Soviet Union in 1922 murdered 28 Orthodox bishops and 1,200 Orthodox priests. Sergius I, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church at the time, said, we were like chickens in a shed from which the cook snatches out her victim in turn. And the Catholic Church didn't fare any better. By 1926, there were no Catholic bishops in the Soviet Union. And by 1941, there were only two Catholic churches. When you look at the Soviet Union, Latin America, North Korea, and other places where different types of socialism have been tried, you see that this unjustifiable violence, it's not a bug. It's a natural outcome of the system. And then it produces something, even when it does produce some kind of revolutionary change, it creates an economic system that just leads to more hardship, to more poverty, and to greater suffering for the poor. Finally, number five, liberation theology does not give the poor what they really need. All right, so I'm going to end where we began. In the Wall Street Journal article I shared with you, the author's main point was that liberation theology failed to provide for the spiritual needs of the people that it claimed to help the most. In 2020, Brazil's foreign minister, Ernesto Araujo, got into a Twitter spat with liberation theologian Leonardo Boff. He said this, When your liberation theology appeared, more than 90% of Brazilians were Catholic. Today, they're only 50%, and they keep going down. Brazilians, especially the poor, rejected your theo-Marxism and ran to the evangelical churches where they can praise Jesus Christ. And ironically, when you read liberation theologians, they seem to be aware of this, but they blame the poor for clinging to religious piety instead of joining the social revolution. One liberation theologian puts it this way, Despite claims to speak for the people, 
to be the voice for the voiceless. Liberationist discourse has often remained alien to its intended clients. Being a voice for the voiceless is not the same as letting the voiceless speak. And even with the best intentions, liberationist activists have had problems shedding directive and paternalistic roles. But the CDF's response to liberation theology, it gets it right when it says, we must listen to the poor to discover what they truly need and not impose our political agendas upon them. It says the following, it is the poor, the object of God's special love, who understand best, and as it were instinctively, that the most radical liberation, which is liberation from sin and death, is the liberation accomplished by the death and resurrection of Christ. It would be criminal to take the energies of popular piety and misdirect them toward a purely earthly plan of liberation, which would very soon be revealed as nothing more than an illusion and a cause of new forms of slavery. Those who in this way surrender the ideologies of the world and to the alleged necessity of violence are no longer being faithful to hope, to hope's boldness and courage, as they are extolled in the hymn to the God of mercy, which the Virgin teaches us. End quote. What's ironic is that when Christians feel that the best way they can help the poor is through politics, they actually become less effective at helping the poor. C.S. Lewis once wrote the following, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. I'd also add that along with spiritual reasons for rejecting the claims of liberation theologians, we have empirical data to show that what causes poverty is not oppression by wealthier classes. As economist Michael Novak noted in his article, The Case Against Liberation Theology, he said, Such countries as Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea of the East Asia Rim are far poorer in natural resources than Latin America, yet have in recent years been far more successful in building highly intelligent and dynamic free economies, overcoming poverty worse in 1945 than that of Latin America. Most Latin American countries exhibit economies that are pre-capitalist, disproportionately state-directed. The three leading classes are still government officials, landholders, and the military. Yet it is precisely here, in its economic theories, that liberation theology comes dangerously close to Marxist analysis, and where most of the confusion arises." End quote. What happens, what ends up happening in many of these countries is that poverty exists because people don't have robust private property rights that would allow them to acquire wealth. Instead, they live in fear of criminals or the government taking their land or their business. And so there's a lack of stability that leads to poverty that needs to be remedied. If you think about what Lewis said, the Christians in history who did the most for the poor, they weren't revolutionaries. They were saints like Peter Claver, the patron saint of slaves. Vincent de Paul, the patron of charities, and of course, St. Teresa of Calcutta. Now, some people might say, well, isn't Pope Francis for liberation theology? So how can you be against it? Or how can you say that the church is against it? But liberation theologians themselves say Pope Francis doesn't belong to their theology. Leonardo Boff, for example, does not claim that label for Pope Francis. He instead says, the important thing is not to be for liberation theology, but for the liberation of the oppressed, the poor, and the victims of injustice. And that, Pope Francis, is without question. Dean Detloff, who wrote The Catholic Case for Communism, he writes in a 2021 article titled, Is Pope Francis a Liberation Theologian? He writes that, Francis was not part of the rising tide of liberation theology. As someone born in 1936 who was part of a religious order that became known for social justice, this was not for lack of opportunity. His social conscience is informed more by the theology of the people, a movement that paralleled liberation theology and prioritized the poor, but one that is unique to Argentina, drawing less on sociological analysis and Marxist literature. Francis could have been a liberation theologian. He chose not to be. Now, in closing, let me say that when Jesus spoke in the synagogue, he said that the words of Isaiah promising a deliverer who would proclaim good news to the poor, release the captives, set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord had been fulfilled in their presence in the synagogue, Luke 4.18. The year he was talking about was the Jubilee. This was celebrated every 50 years in Israel where you canceled debts and freed slaves. Most importantly, the remission of sins were seen as the ultimate debt we could never pay. In the year 2000, the Catholic Church declared its own jubilee and celebrated genuine liberation through Christ, saying, Jesus comes to offer us a salvation which, although primarily a liberation from sin, also involves the totality of our being with its deepest needs and aspirations. Christ frees us from this burden and threat and opens the way to the complete fulfillment of our destiny. And without neglecting authentic justice for the poor, that's the liberation our theology should always keep at the forefront of our evangelism. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this gives you a helpful perspective on liberation theology. And once again, there are elements in it that are true, but it's hard to sift those from the elements that end up distorting the Catholic faith that we have to be careful about. So I hope this was helpful and educational and that you guys just have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.